discuss the ups, downs, and sideways of the sport of figure skating, and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. Let's introduce this week's hosts. Hi, I'm Evie, and I certainly am never taking the stamina I usually build up watching a normal season of skating for granted ever again, because I'm absolutely exhausted after this week of worlds. Hi, I'm Yogita, and I am greatly regretting my decision to become a figure skating fan. Hi, I'm Kite, and I'm feeling like the Brooklyn Nine-Nine GIF where Jake Peralta just plays the guitar and screams. Oh boy, Worlds happened this week? It did indeed. Shouldn't have happened, but here we are. I can't believe that the ISU actually went through with this garbage event. But they did, and now we're sitting here faced with the consequences of that event. So yeah, just to kind of be clear on what's happening in this episode, we are going to really just talk about the competition results of Worlds 2021, and then the next episode will also be World-centric, but it's going to be on the logistics slash the choice to hold this competition, which was certainly a choice. This episode is going to be more like our usual competition coverage that we've, you, you know, that we've been doing for the last couple seasons, and the next one is going to be more like the competition coverage we've been doing for this season. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna dust off our mics and talk properly about some actual skating, which is very strange to get back into that mindset. Very strange. Very weird. But uh, yeah, this world's happened over this week in Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, and as we all know, this is the pre-Olympic worlds. So Olympic spots were given out. Uh, and that's part of why this world was so important. And probably the main reason it even actually happened. Like the main reason the ISU kept it around. You, you would think, given that they almost held worlds last year. I mean, they were forced to cancel last yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. They were forced. This is true. That pretty clearly was not going to happen from the beginning because Sweden's whole approach to COVID has just been really like... Garbage? Yikes. <laughs> I was going for a more diplomatic adjective, but yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can go with garbage. No diplomacy here. This is a no diplomacy episode. <laughs> okay, so let's briefly discuss how exactly Olympic spots are allocated for worlds. And I, will, I say briefly, but this... It's not going to be very brief. Apologies in advance. I read this document like four times over the course of an hour to try and understand this. Yeah, watching watching you and Neve just die over this one ISU document was certainly a time. <laughs> anyway, Olympic spots. Yay. Exciting. So uh, there are 30 spots available for both ladies and men's. 23 available for ice dance and 19 available for pairs. Of those spots, a 24 spots for ladies and men's are allocated to the worlds, 19 for ice dance, and 16 for pairs. Okay, so qualification rules. In order to qualify for three spots at the Olympics, the top two skaters' placements at worlds must add up to 13, or the top one skater must finish no lo lower than silver. Um, and in order to qualify for two spots at the Olympics, either the top two skaters' placements add up to between 14 and 28, or the top one skater finishes in top 10. And then afterwards, all the other spots are allocated per the rank at Worlds until no other spots are available. However, <laughs> and this is the complicated part, if a country is allocated two spots, but only one skater qualifies for the free, that country is only guaranteed one spot at the Olympics, and they must win the additional spot at Neville Horn Trophy in the fall. Similarly, if a country is allocated three spots, but only two skaters qualified for the free, they have to win that third spot at Neville Horn Trophy. So on the 2nd of April, the ISU released a communication confirming the allocation of spots for the Olympics next year as well as those conditional spots that will be up for grabs later this year at Nebelhorn, which we'll include a link to in the description if you're interested in checking those out. But there was a lot of confusion both on social media and also with us behind the scenes trying to work out exactly how these new qualification rules worked because the ISU document that laid out those rules was worded in that kind of typical, extremely dense ISU manner, which they are so well known for. But there, it was worded in such a way that there were multiple conflicting opinions circulating around as to who had the spots and who didn't, especially in relation to whether or not those conditional places that could be won at Nebelhorn counted towards the total spots available at Worlds or not. 
And like even the athletes at the competition themselves were being told conflicting opinions as to whether or not they qualified. Like we had Mikhail Rosina saying he was told he qualified a spot for the Czech Republic with his 19th place finish. But then Donovan Carrillo of Mexico, who finished in 20th, said he hadn't received the spot the next year. But uh, luckily, luckily the ISU cleared this up eventually. And now we have confirmed that both Mikhail and Donovan have spots at the Olympics. But those few days in between the event ending and the communication being released were certainly filled with a lot of speculation that could have easily been avoided if someone had made the original document just, just a little bit easier to understand. Let's move on to actual worlds. Actual worlds. But before we move on to actual worlds, we need to preface this entire discussion with a little bit about what's happening with the Russian team. Because as most of you might know, the Court of Arbitration for Sport ruled against Russia in the uh, doping scandal. And so they, uh, all of the athletes present here weren't allowed to compete for Russia. They were instead representing the Figure Skating Federation of Russia, or FSR. That's why if you saw us tweeting results and saw FSR and you might have been a bit confused, it's Russia, it's just under a different name. You know, we could literally do a whole episode about how this kind of band does basically nothing and it's just like a slap on the wrist. But yeah, it's just like Pyeongchang where the Russian athletes competed uh, not as Russia. Okay, let's move on to World's Figure Skating championships 2021 i feel like this competition was like on par with the level of quality to the last worlds we covered 2019 which is no (laughs) i take umbrage with that only because at least pairs was a valid event at 2019 worlds (laughs) that is true it was the only positive thing about that event but if we have to talk about pairs, let's just talk about pairs here, okay? So in pairs, in gold, we had Anastasia Mishina and Alexander Galiamov of FSR. In silver, we had Sui Wenjing and Han Song of China. And in bronze, we had Alexandra Boykova and Dmitry Kozlovsky of FSR. So, world champions Mishina and Galiamov. Did not have that on my bingo card going into this no. thing. You know, it was on mine and it was really sad. I had them like down to medal, but I was not expecting them to run away with the title here. That was definitely surprising. <laughs> Given how they were scoring in like the local Russian comps, it wasn't that surprising. It was just distressing yeah it's weird because you know we've been watching them skate for so long now like we covered them when they were in juniors and then when they moved up to seniors last season and now we're watching them here at their first worlds take the title it's it's very weird to watch this kind of rise in the way that it's happened so quickly especially because their skating hasn't really like changed that much over the last couple of years, like obviously they've they've grown up a little bit and grown into their skating a bit more. I think I, I noticed that Anastasia. I think she's gone through a bit of a growth spurt lately. I don't know. She seemed a little taller here at Worlds since the last time I saw her. That might just be me forgetting what people look like, though. So take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen like five people in the past year. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's interesting because they've always been the kind of team that's relied on the fact that they're they've got a higher base value than average because they do that triple cell oil or triple cell combo in the free and they have a throw lots and even though they're you know pcs in an ideal world wouldn't compare to someone like soyan han we'll get to that but their elements are solid enough that they can usually get on the podium just on the basis of that if they're close to clean i think this is probably the cleanest free we've seen them put out in in since they went senior internationally internationally at least well i think if you you know were keeping up with the russian comps like the domestic events they were holding throughout the fall there was definitely a trend of you know the russian federation really trying to like push up mishina and galiamov because prior to this season right they had tarasva and morozov and then they had boykova and kozlovsky who were pretty consistently winning medals internationally um so it wasn't all that surprising to me i think that they were like well we should you know, we have three spots to Worlds. We're probably going to have three spots to the, the Olympics. Like, we really need a third team that can realistically challenge for podium positions. So it's not, like, that shocking to me, I think, to see their rise. But I think that, you know, seeing it happen internationally is still really jarring, and I don't agree with it. Yeah. 
Especially because I thought that they would, like, at the end of last season, I thought that they were kind of going to go more with Pavlyuchenko and Kodakin, especially after they got selected for Euros over Machina and Galimov last year. I thought that that might have happened. It's that fight for that third spot, and now Machina and Galimov have won the world title, and uh, they were definitely the the Russians who skated the best here, considering... You know, Teresa Romorov have been all over the place for the last couple of seasons, dealing with injury, dealing with the coaching change. And then Boykova and Kozlovsky have obviously had a rough season with their health this year. So they weren't in the best of form here either. My big issue with Mishnah and Galyamov is that, like, they're good. I'm not going to say that they're not good because they are. They're, they're a top tier team. It's just that compared to everybody else who's here, yeah, they had the technical elements and they they were clean, but even them clean, they should not have had the components score that they received. And Sway and Han lost by two points. They lost a title that should have easily been there if, if they had gotten components they deserved, so... Yeah, there was only, like, just over a point difference in both their PCS and in the free, which is ridiculous to me that Soy and Han only got a 73 for that free skate, considering it was mostly clean apart from the side-by-sides. Like, I will give Machina and Gallimov this. Their skating has improved since I last saw them. <laughs> like, they're definitely improving as a team. I think that they're still kind of lacking in speed and ice coverage uh, in comparison to a lot of the other teams. But that's also something that just comes through experience and they haven't been he- around for much- as-, as long as compared to the other teams that are here. Like, their lifts, even though they're still the speed isn't great, they're looking a lot more stable in the air. I remember, especially during juniors, they would have some really crazy positions, but half the time I would be worried that it looked like he was about to, like, drop her. But, uh, no, they definitely have improved as a team, but that d- still doesn't explain how both Soyan Han and Machine and Galimov scored so close together in PCS in the free. Yeah, well, especially when you consider, like, the group that they were skating in, um, in the free at least. Like, I've never watched Sway and Han live, but I've seen all three of the Russian teams live, and it is really obvious um, that Machine and Galimov they don't have the skating skills or the speed, um, and they cover much less ice than even the other two Russian teams. So it is very prominent, I think, when you put them next to teams who do have, like, those fantastic skating skills and great ice coverage and you know it's like part of it is them being inexperienced but I think they're only a year behind um Boykova and Kozlovsky right they've been out of juniors like a year apart from each other so yeah I don't know I feel like they have improved um but I think like kind of ice coverage and speed is is one of those things where it's really hard to like significantly improve that once you're at this level and your skating skills are kind of your skating skills at this point like you know there are skaters who manage to you know improve on that but seeing improvement that the scores suggest I think is not there I I think if we also like compare them to the last time we saw them internationally they never hit 70 in components before their highest previously was 68 in the free uh, whereas here they got 73 in components. Five points is a lot. Even, you know, it's been like a year and a half, but that's still a lot for a year and a half because like the first part of the season really just didn't exist at all. Um, so it's yeah. not like they were kind of building like an international portfolio where it's like they're consistently, you know, winning things and, you know, building their reputation. Like this is the first time they've competed internationally since last year, like last season. Um, Because I'm not counting, like, the Grand Prix, because those were basically just domestic events. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, Sway and Han did have, you know, the minor errors on the jumps, but I don't think that those errors justify them being so close in components. Like, those errors should not have, you know, been penalized to the point where it was impacting their PCS so much. Yeah, especially because that free skate for Sway and Han, you know, it it is a world record holding program. And it's just crazy that those errors, while they, you know... They, they did happen, but the rest of the program wasn't really affected. Like, their overall performance wasn't affected by those errors that they made in the side-by-sides. I just don't understand how they couldn't at least get a 75 for that program that they skated. It's just... For context, when they skated this at Saitama, they got 77 in PCS. Yeah, I you know, unless you're trying to say this program got, what, like, four points worse <laughs> in PCS in the past two years... I think this is, you know, not an issue that's unique to pairs, but there is a lot of reputation scoring that you see when you're talking about component scores that, you know, skaters who have been around longer 
and generally have been consistent in their competi competition results will see their PCS rise. And I think that's unfortunate, even though it is the reality. And unfortunately, you know, Sway and Han, have they haven't competed since Four Continents in 2020, which was 13 months ago. And, yep. you know, even though there weren't really international events being held then, you did still see, you know, more of the Russian teams competing domestically in the fall. Um, and, you know, that's obviously not the fault of, you know, any of the teams that they weren't able to compete, but it probably was factored in when they were awarding PCS here. Yeah, especially because they ended up skipping Cup of China earlier this year due to Tsong recovering from surgery. And then we also had Wenjing sidelined afterwards by a foot fracture that also kept them from training for a while. So I think their preparation time for Worlds was much shorter because of that, because of those setbacks they faced with their health. So like, it's impressive to say the least that they were both able to push through that and also including like the mental pressure that must be on them as China's top pair going into the home Olympics next year. Like it must be really, really taxing for them that, and you know, all the added mental pressure that must've been piled on due to the COVID-19 pandemic and how that itself affected their training overall this year. So yeah, the pandemic caused a lot of issues. It caused a lot of like differentials in like skate in the skating time that different skaters had. So some skaters like the Russians, were competing consistently and had a normal training schedule and everything, whereas other skaters just did not have training time, didn't have access to their coaches because they were in other countries, uh, couldn't compete, obviously, because competitions weren't being held. Uh, so just like the difference in training up until Worlds, you really see it in the athletes and the performances that they put out here. So for the skaters who didn't get a chance to train I honestly applaud them for like taking the effort to still show up here because like Olympic spots are on the line despite the fact that this competition shouldn't have been held <laughs> at all uh, but like for example the British team of Zoe Jones and Christopher Boyaji they only trained for 23 days before attending this event that's crazy they didn't make the free skate and they, they finished last but like 23 days of, of training time. If I had only 23 days of training leading up to a Worlds, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't show up. But Olympic spots are on the line, so I understand. That's the thing, right? That's also, like, kind of makes you really prone to injury because you're trying to squeeze what should have been a season of training into three weeks, like three and a half yeah. weeks. Like, you're going to, you know, really be putting a lot of stress on your body because that needs to be stretched out over, you know, months. Uh, I worry the amount of injuries were, like, going to hear about in the next couple of weeks of skaters post this competition talking about their experiences preparing for this world honestly you know we also had like we just kind of touched on briefly we had Swain Han who are both recovering from injuries so he had a hip slash lower back injury um that was kind of plaguing him for a couple of seasons and last spring after four continents he got surgery to fix it and it seemed like he actually needed the surgery kind of through the season but they waited until you know they were sure it was over before he went and got the surgery and then she had a foot fracture she's kind of been chronically injured for a couple years as some people may know she had a foot fracture that happened around october of last year which is probably why they pulled out of cup of china which was supposed to be their kind of domestic grand prix event and so they couldn't really resume their on ice training until the end of january of this year um and they couldn't start jumping until about three weeks ago and then they came here but you know like i said it's like what is you know, that degree of kind of intense training in such a condensed amount of time going to do to injuries that are already chronic and need medical attention. And not even to say about like the mental stress of having to compete here and go through, you know, travel international travel at a time like this is just the pressure that must have been on all of these athletes here is ridiculous. It's like you've got the you've got the two genders of di of different kind of of training this season. One being that you kind of have limited or restricted eyes access because of lockdowns, or the other being that you have access to training, but your entire training center has been swarmed with COVID. Those are like the two options you have. I feel like uh, that we've seen. And yeah, the Russians unfortunately had a lot of problems with a lot of their major training camps having major COVID outbreaks, not just in pairs, but in basically every other discipline as well. I don't, I, don't, I think every other discipline that had a major 
COVID outbreak at a training camp. Someone made a flowchart of this, and I think we've talked about it in a previous episode, but I think at this point there's literally like three members of the Russian national team who haven't had COVID. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about this in kind of our logistics episode, but it just, again, points to how ridiculous it was to even conceive of having this competition where it's like either you had skaters who were training but you know were affected by covid which could still be affecting you know their stamina and their physical ability or you had skaters who couldn't train because their rinks were closed like as a precaution and then they basically had to you know get back into shape within you know a couple weeks prior to the event and then they're risking injury anyway so you know whichever group you're in you're not really winning at the end very much a lose-lose situation that they created here so great job guys there is a third group that is has access to training Mm. with not a coach should we okay let's let's talk about something positive let's go on to some of our like the notable performances that were actually enjoyable here at that world yes let's talk about riku miura and ryuchi kihara of japan they qualified japan for two spots at the Olympics. Not that they're going to use their second spot, but they did. Yeah, they don't have a second team. But so. the option is there. I'm so impressed with Miku and Yuchi. Uh, they've shown so much growth in their performance in the last season. They've only been together for, what, two seasons at this point? This is the second season, yeah. Yeah, and I remember last season, they were, like, really out of sync. <laughs> um, sometimes their side-by-sides were not that great sing and sync but now they're like so much better and i am like greatly impressed that i think in this case they had the time to train and to actually like focus on their elements um and work on these pairs elements and they've become a really strong mid-tier team which i never thought i'd say about japanese pairs again it's very nice to say i think that like especially the extra time they've had over this year you can just tell that their relationship as a team is a lot stronger like they've gotten to know each other better as skaters and you can see that their awareness on the ice of each other is a lot better than it was last season when they were a bit more like tentative because they haven't been skating together long but now they've had the time and you can also see that like you know, in the short program when they did the death spiral and all that ice got caught in Riku's hair <laughs> it was and she had beautiful. flipped it. She flipped it and had the dramatic ice flip uh, of all the ice spray. And you could just see, you could see Ryuchi kind of laugh at what was happening. And it just, I don't know, he, he's always been a little bit of a, a character, been really pretty cheery with his previous partner. But you could just see that now, like after both their programs and how he was really excited and happy for them, I just, I really like to see that kind of stuff on the ice of, of the teams having like good relationships with each other. Yeah, I, I really am interested to see how they're going to brand themselves as a team going into the Olympics, the programs they choose, uh, because... I, I really want them to choose programs that work really well for them and be able, so they're able to really show their best sides at the Olympics. And hopefully the JSF will take note and realize they should start investing in Japanese pairs again because Japanese pairs can be great. They were great once. They have a solid team here. Um, and hopefully they continue investing in Enrico and Yuchi and they start investing more in pairs because... As of right now, there is no other pair team in Japan. There is no junior, up-and-coming junior pairs team. Riku and Ryuchi are the only Japanese pairs team (laughs) that exists. I I think it's especially right now, looking at the Olympics next year, and especially with the team event, like, if you can get Riku and Ryuchi's scores up a little bit more than they already are, if they can get some more international experience next year before the Olympics happens you know obviously Japan their problem with the team event is that they have extremely strong single skaters but their pairs and dance teams aren't as strong internationally and so when it comes to meddling at the team event their chances aren't as good as you would think so if they can just get Riku and Yuchi up a little bit more they actually stand a chance at possibly like at getting bronze at the team event I feel and on to another one of our favorites who unfortunately did not get to do as well as they hoped. Uh, Cheng Peng and Yang Jin, also from China. Yeah, I was really upset that they didn't get have the skates they wanted here. I feel like, you know, kind of just it was a perfect storm of things just going wrong for them, especially in the short program. Like, she kind of tripped. You know, it was just like a freak fall, like they weren't even doing an element, um, which, you know, it happens, but that would obviously rattle you. 
And then also her costume, like the zipper on her costume came undone. So it was basically just kind of open from the side. And that would also be really just jarring, I think, when you're trying to, you know, have a competitive program. And it just seemed to kind of all really affect them negatively. And they didn't quite get to where they wanted at this competition. But it was really great to see them again. And these these two programs are, are wonderful on them. They skate them so well. I personally just want to speak to their growth over their past quad because they became a, a team back in 2016 2017 and they were kind of like the the weird quirky team from china they didn't even make the free skate at pyeongchang but now here they are three years later and they're one of the top pairs teams in the world and i'm just really really proud of them um for their evolution and them finding programs that really suit them and their storytelling and I, as much as I love Sway and Han, I actually feel a lot more connected with Peg and Jin and their skating. And they're actually my favorite pairs team. So I'm really happy to see how far they've come. And I hope that they have a really good Olympic season. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm so happy that they've had such amazing growth over these last couple of years. It's really nice to see this kind of team come from a certain place and rise up over the course of a few years. It's so nice to see that kind of stuff, especially because, you know, at the last Worlds, they only just missed out on the podium. They almost got up to bronze. Should have been bronze. Should have been bronze. Bronze was Zabiako and Ember. Yeah, I was really looking forward to seeing them going into here. And unfortunately, you know, they didn't have the skates they wanted. But, you know, hopefully their early season next year will set them up to have a really great Olympics. Because, of course, the Olympics next year are in Beijing and it's going to be home ice. And all the Chinese teams will want to really bring it. And so I, re- I really hope for the best for them. And yes, go go Peng and Jin. Yay. <laughs> okay, speaking of the Olympics, uh, let's talk about Olympic spots. So FSR comes out of the pair event as the only country with guaranteed three spots. Due to the unfortunate event that the third Chinese pairs could not come to the event, China actually only has two guaranteed spots at the Olympics, So though they did qualify for three. As we mentioned earlier, they can guarantee their third spot by sending... Uh, Chinese pairs team to Nebelhorn. Oh yeah, I'm not sure if we clarified this at the beginning, but whoever they sent to Nebelhorn can't be either of the teams who are here, so they're going to need to find another team. Yeah, and there are a couple of other pairs teams in China right now that we've seen compete, but I I don't think any of them are close to the, the scoring level of Swainhan and Peng and Jin, so I guess it'll be interesting to see how they fare at Nebelhorn. I mean, I think every event at Nebelhorn next year is going to be really, really interesting. Given the level of quality we typically see at Nebelhorn for pairs I think I I think any of the Chinese pairs teams can do it the U.S. uh, Italy and Canada uh, have retained their two spots and Japan as we mentioned is guaranteed one spot but they have qualified a second spot that they're not going to be used looking at some of the other countries who qualify multiple spots for pairs we have the U.S. and also Canada uh, Canada qualified one spot with another spot up for grabs at Nebelhorn due to Kirsten Moore Towers and Michael Marinaro, who didn't have a great outing in the short, uh, placing 10th there, but managed to climb their way back up with a much more solid three, placing 6th overall. And then Evelyn Walsh and Trent Michaud placing 12th. Uh, so Moore Towers and Marinaro will definitely be sent next year, considering they're Canada's top team and have been for this entire quad. So, but for that second spot, you know, providing that they do get it at Nebelhorn, uh, Walsh and Michaud have a pretty great chance of getting it, considering they've consistently medaled at nationals in both juniors and seniors in the last few years. Uh, Ilyshechkina and Bilodo, who placed third back at nationals in 2020, split over this last off season. There are a handful of other Canadian teams like Matt and Furland and Stellato and Deschamps all around kind of that same mid to low tier scoring range right now that could potentially vie for that second spot. But it really just depends on the first half of the season, depending on how many competitions we get uh, next year and how they score and how they fare. And then the US, they managed to qualify two spots here after Alexa Kinnearum and Brandon Fraser came in seventh. And then uh, Ashley Kane Gribble and Timothy LeDuc came in ninth. And I think it's going to be really interesting next year to see the fight over those two Olympic spots domestically because we know that the pairs, US pairs field is pretty deep right now. So not only do we have the two teams that we saw here, but we also have teams like Jessica Callalang and Brian Johnson, as well as Audrey Liu and Misha Mitrovanov, both of which were on the US Nationals podium this year. And they've both shown really great growth in their skating over the last couple of years. 
considering how closely these teams are scored normally, it'll be really interesting to see how each of them try to brand themselves for the Olympic year, like what programs they'll choose and just how they cope with the early season and try to secure those spots on the team. It's good that the USA managed to qualify two pair spots this time for the Olympics because if we remember at Pyeongchang, they only just missed out on qualifying two at Worlds 2017. I believe they were like one place finish off of qualifying two pair spots for the US. Uh, but now they've got two here, so good for them. Yay. We like we like growth. <laughs> yes, growth is good. So as we mentioned, 16 spots for pairs were allocated here at Worlds. There will be three spots up for grabs at Nibelhorn, including the conditional spot for China. All right, let's move on to the men's event. Do we have to? Um, listen, the, me- the men's event was the only valid event at this competition. And even then, it was still not that valid. So our podium here is Nathan Chen from the U.S., surprise silver medalist Yuba Kagiyama from Japan, and Yuzuru Hanyu from Japan in his first bronze medal in 10 years. This event was surprising in so many ways because, like... Firstly, like, even though, you know, all of the circumstances about Worlds, everything that's gone on the past year, the quality of skating overall was pretty good throughout this event, which is very strange considering I go into most men's events expecting everyone to kind of fall over the place. But here I was surprised, especially in the short. We had a lot of people skate, like, pretty decent shorts. Yeah, uh, yeah, the short was fairly clean. Depends when you started watching in the free. You started after, like, the ice resurfacing. It was pretty good. You know, I, you know, they started skating clean in the free the second I started watching. So maybe that was, maybe I should have just watched all of the men's free. <laughs> they were just like, oh, crap, Yogs is here. We need to, we need to all skate good now. <laughs> I should have, I have, I should have shown up for Boyan. Yeah, this yeah. is, this is squarely on your shoulders. <laughs> but, but yeah, the men event, honestly, it was probably the highlight of the entire world. Everyone was skating really, really great, put out really strong programs and, Honestly, I, I really enjoyed watching it, even though some things were at odds. I will we'll preface this entire conversation about the men's by saying that the rankings for the men were correct. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of discussion on the podium after the fact, but I think we are all of us here uh, pretty much in consensus that the podium here was correct. That said, you know, obviously, if you get into kind of the details of it, there are things that I think we all disagree with in terms of how this event was scored. For example, in the short program, if you want to talk about components, <laughs> who doesn't want to talk about components? Yuzuru won in the short program with a score of 106, um, and he had a 47 um, in PCS. And then you had Nathan and Jason Brown of the United States um, with the exact same score in PCS, 46, and then like six men squished in like 43 to 44 range and i think there, there's a pretty valid argument for nathan needing to be scored lower in pcs in the short program given he had a major error like he did fall on his opening jump you know if you actually go by what the rule book says then there should be a pcs cap on that like from the outset but when have they ever followed that rule <laughs> yeah that said you know i it wouldn't have made a difference to the overall standings you know all, all else being equal nathan being ahead of like shoma and and Mikhail in PCS. I very much don't agree with that, actually, because it's not, you know, like we said earlier, PCS kind of gets a reputation boost as you go. Um, And it's not like Jason and Shoma are, like, unknown. Like, they've been competing internationally for years. So they really shouldn't be losing PCS to Nathan, you know, if it was scored according to the criteria that's actually in the rulebook. And then, you know, obviously for Jason, it's kind of the same thing, where Jason Brown should be, you know, top two or three in the world in terms of PCS. You know, maybe seems a little bit nitpicky. Like I said, it wouldn't really have made a difference to the overall standings. Maybe in the bottom of the top 10, you can make an argument. Yeah, there definitely would have been like a shuffling around of like some of the top 10, but the podium would have been the same. So in general, podium is fine. Components, judges can't recognize skating skills. I feel like, especially with this short program, considering how everyone skated pretty well, 
and how the scores were all much closer together than I kind of expected. Like you kind of expect in most men's competitions for everyone to be a little bit more spread out after the short. And so the free or the results are overall are kind, not exactly are a given, but are a little bit more predictable sometimes. But here going into the free, like there were so many opportunities for movement that I was just, I after the short, I was like, man, I'm really excited to actually watch this free. Like, like when was the last competition where we had eight men? over 90 points after the short program that like gave me heartburn you know basically everyone from four to like eight nine after the short program were were within like a few points of each other and i was like oh this is not good like <laughs> this is not good for my heart it's not good for my health <laughs> quoting roman sadowski there but uh, yeah the free like the first two groups like we said earlier were a mess and ex- pretty hard to sit through there was definitely some performances there that were not up to the level that I think everyone was expecting obviously going into this event I don't think anyone watching was expecting to see like skates on par with the usual level of consistency or quality that we would like come to expect from worlds in a normal season and that's completely like not the fault of the athletes themselves you know most are coming into the event with little or inconsistent training from the past year due to either lockdowns restricting ice time or from illness and injury so it's honestly like a wonder that everyone skated as well as they did this week considering the like average level of training everyone was able to do beforehand i think also that 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 might have been partly due to the ice quality of the free skate for some reason that like on the last day of competition it seemed like the ice quality was poorer on average than it had been for the rest of the days of the event like you know when the temperature in the ring drops and the ice gets a little bit softer you can see the build up of that slush like sitting next to the boards around the edges of the rink and you could see that there on that day and like anytime anyone would land a jump you could see the spray of ice and i was just looking at everyone falling on most mostly on edge jumps and going oh this looks like bad quality ice this looks like it's gonna turn into a swimming pool in half an hour guys come on sweden surely you guys know how to do ice you're a nordic country after the first two groups like everybody in the third and fourth groups were like we're here we're bringing it and it was honestly a really fantastic final two groups nate skated basically a clean program honestly one of his best free skates he's skated in a while in my opinion that was your textbook definition of like technical excellence on ice. So I really applaud what Nate put out there. I would say that uh, like I didn't watch uh, US Nats or Skate America because I did not want to wake up early for those events this year because of like there's too much going on. I'm not going to wake up early to watch. No, this was the first time that I actually saw Nate's free. And, you know, the last couple of seasons I haven't really enjoyed his programs uh as much as some of the other men but this free i think is like this is the most i've enjoyed a nate free skate since like his senior debut honestly it's yeah i think it's a good program for him it's this it's the cleanest he's obviously the cleanest he skated it um he's it's been a rough outing for him earlier this season with this program so i'm happy that he was able to figure it out especially after the short he managed to put out like a great program and i think it's tes was it was pretty much the well deserved here so you know i just want to say like i am genuinely so impressed by his ability to go out time after time and deliver basically clean free skates especially given how crazy his technical content is um and yeah we did see him struggling earlier in the season you know he wasn't able to go back to school this year because of of covid and it really seemed like he had a pretty rough start i mean you guys probably remember this you know there was like a couple minutes during U.S. Nationals where, you know, he had a kind of a rough go in the free skate and it seemed like there was a chance he wasn't going to win. So, you know, if you want to talk about like heartburn inducing moments, that was <laughs> that was pretty rough. But, you know, he really pulled it together after a really surprising fall in the short program. Yeah, on the Lutz. You know, you, d- you don't expect that. That's the kind of the one quad, that and the toe that always seemed really safe for Nate. And here when, you know, the opening jump, the fall, I was just like, oh, oh, damn. Haven't seen that in quite a while. Yeah. Shall we move on to the man, the myth, the legend? (laughs) Yuzuru. He had to skate last, which, you know, has kind of the pressures on itself of skating last. You know, prior to this event, he did make it very clear that he was, you know, really just interested in coming here, getting Japan spots, like staying far away from everybody and just making it back to Japan like in one piece healthy. As the man deserves. So, you know, <laughs> I'm glad that he was able to prioritize that over his actual results here. Considering everything, that the, the kind of season that he's had and basically being forced to compete 
first at nationals to you know get assigned to the world's team and then here at worlds to get japan the olympic spots like i don't blame him for feeling that way about this competition i mean if i was in his position i certainly wouldn't want to be there yeah. no are you like, if there was like, literally an earthquake as i was like heading to worlds i'd be like I'm, we're just not going but what really surprised me is that like his practices are basically clean like he didn't ha- seem like he had like any major issues he was maybe, doing but... very well in practice and i do want to say like if he had been clean in the free skate i think he would have won and i don't oh, think yes. it would have been that close yeah clean user at japanese nationals scored 215 for his free skate and i think they probably would have given him a boost just being the last skater because usually you know if you skate last they're like well no one's gonna go after you so we can kind of wild out honestly i can't remember the last time yuzu skating skated last in a free it's been a minute i think the last couple times he's always been like second to last or even earlier in the the free groups it's weird to see him skate last year yeah the, the main reason for that is that they didn't have a draw here so they just like skated in rank order yeah and after the free skate there were reports first c- circulated by russian media and then confirmed directly by Yuzu himself, saying that after the free skate, he actually had an asthma attack. I, as someone who has asthma, I, I will say that I do feel it coming, and he he actually has a worse case of asthma than I do, so probably he could feel it. And you can also see it on his face in warm-up, like, as cringy as it's to say, he didn't have that fire in his eyes that you're used to seeing from Yuzu, so. You know, also, sometimes you just have a bad day, and, you know, not the end of the world. He's been doing this for... Very, very long time. Yuzuru Hanyu has nothing to prove to the sport of figure skating anymore. The fact that he's here and he's still on podiums 10 years into his career. Yeah, like at the end of the day, we should all just be really grateful and thankful to him that he's still around and delivering these performances to us. Okay, let's change topics a little bit and go into the PCS for the free skate. Welcome to the... Jason and Mikhail should have won PCS hands down yeah. show. <laughs> yes. Yes. I will say yeah. this quote. I will say it. Jason and Mikhail deserve to win the components here. They had the standout free skates of the event, in my opinion. I loved it. I will go watch both of them. They were wonderful. I, I just don't know how anybody can watch them and say, you know what? You don't deserve a 9.75 in skating skills. Yeah, you both deserve 90 in PCS here. That makes sense. No judges. It does not. It does not make any sense. I mean, Jason's just simply has some of the best pure skating out of anyone in this men's field. Like, his speed and ice coverage is just always excellent. And he has some of the most, like, complicated transitions, both in and out of his elements, like, far more than the majority of the men here displayed. And, like, that's not even mentioning his performance and interpretation ability, which, like, we've seen season after season consistently impress us and then Mikhail his skating skills are also extremely good like the depth and quality of his edges in his steps and turns and his transitions just it really takes his skating up to that next level where you can just sit back and watch and just appreciate the overall quality of how good his basics are especially when Mikhail skated pretty like he skated almost clean he like had some issues in the second half of the program and then Jason is Jason like I mean I I would put him in the top of PCS even on a bad day considering you know his just pure quality of skating seeing them both in the 90s in the early 90s I'm just like "Mm, choices well you know at least they got the same PCS (laughs) (laughs) okay let's move on to talk about some of our favorites and let's begin with world silver medalist Yuma Kageyama. I find it really funny that during the event, like all throughout the commentary that was provided by the ISU by Mark Hanratty, he constantly talked whenever when Yuma was on about how much of a surprise it was that he was doing well. And meanwhile, all of us, I think, were just like, Mark, have you not watched skating for the past season or something? Did you watch Four Continents last year? I feel like anyone who's watched Yuma's career over the past couple of years you know it's not a surprise that he managed to get on this podium i was waving my yuma kageyama for world's podium flag the entire event i was so happy i feel like we we've all been watching yuma since like the start of his junior career so like we basically seen him grow into the skater that he currently is and we all know like how much more he can become and i'm just so so impressed He's here. He's there in the wings. I, he's going to be a world champion one day. Knock on wood. If you just kind of think about the nerves of steel that 
you have to have, especially not having that much competitive experience yet, to skate between Nathan and Yuzuru at your debut world. Like, I don't think anybody else could have done that. Yeah, and, you know, honestly, he's kind of started, he's rocketed up this season. And it, he reminds me a lot of Yuzuru, honestly, from like, you know, 2011, 2012, because he was also kind of this you know, fresh senior, breakout star, medaled at his first Worlds. And I'm just super impressed, honestly, with how Yuma has really cemented himself as, like, Japan's number two man in a season that was this strange. It's insane that we've literally, like, Yuma came up into juniors when we started this podcast back in 2018, (laughs) and now we're talking about him as world silver medalist. It's kind of insane that we've seen, like, that amount of growth. Like, I think the only thing at the moment that he really kind of needs to focus on probably is performance and interpretation because that kind of, in his programs, isn't completely there yet, but, like, his technical foundation is so solid. His skating skills are incredible. His hands down like the fastest man in this competition (laughs) i've seen him skate live as like a junior and he he he's fast he's so fast and he's just yeah especially his reactions in the kiss and cry to his scores in both the short and the free oh my god the best kiss and cry reactions of the day like when he found out he was on the podium he was like so joyful especially because his main coach is his dad and so you got some of those really cute reactions in the kiss and cry i mean how proud must you be of your son getting his world silver medal in his first outing at worlds that's just insane thank you matt you're you're, you're axel you're axel please (laughs) please (laughs) axel's were not they were not a part of this event speaking of another japanese man let's talk about shoma for a bit because you know i think he considering the circumstances he did really well here honestly i didn't know what to expect from shoma like he did reasonably well at japanese nationals but he also said that he didn't really have much a lot of practice time coming into worlds so i was a little iffy but hey he did it yeah i think you know ever since he moved to switzerland and started training with stefan it seems to have really helped his like energy and his focus like if you just contrast you know what happened two years ago at worlds when he finished fourth and he was really devastated by it um and this time he also finished fourth but he just seems so much more like in control and like satisfied at the end um and just like more fulfilled as a skater and it's really wonderful to see like the growth that he's undergone in the past you know season and a half we spoke about him a little bit before but let's talk about Mikhail Kolyada uh because he has certainly had quite a quad and have been a little bit all over the place but now he's kind of brought it all back together he's back he had his surgery he got married he has that what he he can quad again he's he's great honestly i'm i'm so happy that everything worked out he he's with mishin now and mishin somehow fixed his jumps thank you mishin his jumps were never the issue i think it was like his confidence was the issue i think his wife fixed that honestly (laughs) my guy disappeared for half a season got a wife came back and it's just like a different person. Him and Keegan. Just in the in the wife corner, literally like 0.01 apart after the short program. The two wife guys side by side. <laughs> they 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 finished back to back too in the free. We love that. Well, especially because like the last time I remember Mikhail skating really solidly was like 2019 Euros short program when he skated clean and like and got a, an 100 plus score, but. Ever since then, and also in that season, like he was a little bit all over the place. And obviously he had his health issues and then went through his coaching change over this last off season. And now we saw him in some of the Russian domestic events earlier in the year. And go, I, like, I remember watching him at test skates and going, wow, like this is insane that he's back to the level of quality that we've seen in the past from him, if not better. Watching him skate is so it's so nice he's got such an ease and grace his carriage on the ice like his posture and his arms and upper body especially in his free skate like honestly whoever decided to give him that nuria balletic free skate deserves a raise he said he said he might keep it for the olympics so please please (laughs) misha please like from the very like start of that free skate i was just he, he was just like in his lines and it was like you could take photos of like his free skate and he'd probably be in perfect position in every photo and it's 
other brilliance. I, I think it's probably out of all of the free skates we saw here, it is like definitely my favorite free of the day. Like I, I agree. It was hands down. No competition. Cause just because we've seen Misha have such a, a time over the last couple of years, especially in the free, like the coaching change and the difference in approach from that Mission's camp has brought him, I think it's had a real positive like effect on the way he's been skating. Yeah, I I agree wholeheartedly. I am very curious. He currently only ha- is only skating with his quad toe, which is gorgeous when he lands it correctly. Um, but in order to really be a metal contender, he'd need a second quad. So I'm curious if he will actually bring back his quad lutz, which, while well, a thing of beauty when he can land it with a jump he never really could control and land correctly when he did ha- try using it he landed it once a cup of china he yeah. once in cup of china and then he yeah. never landed it again i i, I love that boat you and i knew specifically <laughs> i know i know we had to say cup of china because that's just oh it's ingrained in my mind that one quad lutz his quad lutz is literally so big he can't control it so his air position is, like, really terrifying. There's videos from him from, like, the summer of him landing it in practice again. So he might actually bring it back. And I think Mishin can definitely help with the control aspect of that jump. So if he does bring it back, he would be a serious contender for a medal at Beijing. Okay, so let's let's talk about the other wife bro. Wife guy. Keegan Messing, who also... I was unprepared to do this well. Especially the free. The free was so surprising. Keegan, for me, has like always been that skater that you knew could be a podium contender if he was consistent and skated two clean programs. And we haven't actually seen him skate all season. So Canada choosing him over Roman to try and get the two spots for Canada for the Olympics was definitely an interesting choice because we we already knew Keegan has the higher scoring potential over Roman, but the question was, could he show us that potential in real life and bring it at Worlds? And he did. He came out as two spots, guys. Woohoo! Thanks, Keegs! Well, conditional <laughs> spots. But yeah, he was sixth at Worlds. I don't know what his knees are made of, but whatever that is, I would like some of that for my joints because the way that he saved some of his arms, I don't know if you guys saw the footage from him in practice. Like yes. that one jump that he did and fell on and then just like bounced right back up again. I'm just like, my dude, <laughs> how do you do this? It's like break dancing on ice. I think when you, he's kind of talked about, you know, what his training process was like this season because you know he wasn't able to have access to his rink and he was up in alaska where he lives and he ended up doing a lot of training i think on like frozen ponds and frozen lakes and you know they couldn't he couldn't go to the gym obviously so he was using like chainsaws as weights and car batteries chainsaws and car batteries <laughs> never change keegan <laughs> also keegan in a cowboy hat with like that giant canadian flag during the dance event was probably like the best best thing that happened this weekend i think that's probably the most i've enjoyed that free skate of his because we obviously we saw it last season and i think maybe it was the fact that he's gonna be a dad soon that the dad rock program finally like i was just like yes keegan i'm here for this or just seeing him live more than usual i was just like i'm on the keegan messing train i'm not getting off it i'm so happy that he was able to skate really well here i've always like complained about keegan's choices to be the most canadian in his programs but you know what keegan keep it up let's go on to talk about jason brown now who luckily managed to save some of the us's spots after vincent joe had not the greatest day out in the short program here yeah vincent (laughs) unfortunately had a very rough short program didn't make the free and Jason really had to step up and kind of, you know, get to that max of 13. And he did, with ease. And I hope that this is the trigger that the U.S. Fed needs to actually appreciate what a gem they have in Jason Brown and, like, make him U.S. number two, because I feel like he has done more than enough. Oh, yes. he Jason Brown is, is hands down, in my eyes, number two. He's proven himself. I think in the prior quad, he was his like he was inconsistent. He didn't really at some points he didn't have like the perspective he needed to really push himself. But like after not getting chosen for the team Pyeongchang, I think that's really like pushed him to give him that perspective. 
that he really needs, especially and then with the switch to training at at the cricket club, he he's really like taken the squad to evolve and become the best of Jason Brown. And in my eyes, he he is U.S. number two, and honestly, there's no doubt. I I think if the U.S. were to choose someone over him for the Olympic team, they'd be they become laughing stocks. Given his body of work, which the USFS does take into account as one of their criteria for choosing Olympic spots, it should be a question. And let's just, like, that short program, that his cinnamon short program, it's perfect for him. Like, that choreography that Rohin did for him is just, like, I mean, Rohin's short programs for Jason are always really excellent. Like, they have a, clearly a really great working relationship together with his choreography, but I think like Cinnamon might probably be my favorite short program of his now it's just it's so strong and impactful plus he's keeping it for the olympic year yay and honestly dare i say it might be one of my favorite short programs of all time it's just it's so stunningly beautiful also some small wins for jason he landed albeit and under rotated uh, a quad style of in the free he, he didn't fall or pop it, which he usually does, so I will take the wins where I can get it. His axles were also a little bit tight here, but that's kind of, you know, his axles have never been a strong suit, so... It's the way of Jason. They have gotten better. They've definitely gotten a lot more consistent than they were in the past, but they're, they're still a little bit tight on the landing. But, you know, again... I, considering all the circumstances of this event, I will happily take Jason finishing really well here in his skates here as a good sign. Let's talk about Hanyan, who honestly, I'm just happy to see Hanyan skates. I don't care how well he does. He's just he's just a pleasure to watch. His skating is so special. His opening triple axle, triple toe in the free, the height and distance he got on both of those jumps is just... Honestly, probably my favorite jumping pass of that of that free skate, like the the entire free skate event. But oh, I I also like feel so bad for him going into the, his free skate because he knew he had to do be extremely clean because of Boyang, who unfortunately put out two very unfortunate programs here, and he fell on the on his triplets, which unfortunately ended up costing China their two spots. So. I will argue he should have gotten like 90 in, in components anyway, and then his they wouldn't have lost him to begin with because he would have been in the position he needed. But yeah, it's it's unfortunate, especially like now now we can move on to talk about Boyang, who I don't really want to talk about, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of important to talk about Boyang, given that we're going into the Beijing Olympics, especially with the amount of pressure on his shoulders. He knew the Olympic spots were on the line and they were... Not just any Olympic spots, there are Olympic spots for Beijing, home Olympics, and that like he needed to do well to, at the very least, keep their two spots, if not attempt to get three spots for, for Chinese men, and it was it was truly like I I don't think I've seen, Boyan fall apart this badly since. 2018 worlds yeah post olympic worlds it was hard to sit through and like i'm interested to see what's gonna happen to boyang now because we we got the news recently that brian also and tracy wilson got added to his coaching team on his isu bio and then they were in the kiss and cry with him here at the event and he talked about the possibility of going to canada if the situation improved I honestly don't know how that's going to fare for him, just considering it's so close to the Olympic season at this point, how much work they can get done in the lead up to Beijing. Because obviously coaching changes, especially moving countries for coaching, is such a big shift. I'm interested to see what his decision making process will be in the choice to go to Canada or not. And how that's going to affect his skating moving forward. Honestly, I don't think he'll have much of a choice. I think the Chinese Federation has seen that like him staying with his current coaching team has not made the improvements that they've needed, and they need him to do well in Beijing. He, he has even more pressure on his shoulders now, and they're going to do whatever they need to do to get him up to par. I, I'm really worried with all that pressure on his shoulders, to be honest, whether or not he'll able to handle it because as we as we know with Boyang 
his issues is not his technical skills because we know he he has the tech it, his issue has always been with his mental fortitude so yeah i just hopefully the off season will be kind to him and he'll come into the olympic year really ready and raring to go i just i just really hope for the best for boyang is basically it moving on to the olympics japan has three spots all things considered Unless something drastic happens, the Olympic team is Yuzuru Yuma Shoma. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't see that changing at all. Unless Yuzuru manifests the quad axle at some point on the Grand Prix and decides that he's good. He's Yuma has proven himself to be able to handle the nerves, and that's honestly super important because Yuma uh, is a podium contender now. So they're not going to not send Yuma. Shoma has already won an Olympic medal. He's going. There's no world where, he, where Japan does not send Yuzuru unless he says specifically he is not going. The US has two guaranteed spots and a third conditional spot that they need to collect at Nebelhorn. Nathan is obviously going to Olympics. The US would be dumb if they didn't send Jason. Um, Vincent did not qualify for three, which is why US has a conditional three spots here. So... The U.S. will need to send a man who is not Nate or Jason to Neville Horn to get their third Olympic spot. Yaroslav is up for his citizenship for this year. Uh, so if he does get his citizenship, he can go to Beijing. Uh, so, But whether or not he will is still up in the air. And then another one of our favorites, Jun Huan Cha, managed to secure one spot and then another conditional spot for Korean men at the Olympics next year as well. And he put out some really great skates here despite his training situation in Korea regarding the lack of access to ice time, being away from his coaches at TCC throughout the last year, dealing with injury issues including back pain and then a ruptured leg muscle which he's been on painkillers for for the last month. Like, all of that while still having to compete in both Korean Nationals and the ranking competition just in this past month before Worlds, which we'll talk a bit more in depth about when we go into the ladies. But he's, like, definitely had a bit of a rough go of it lately, but, like, he still managed to do so excellently here despite all that. I'm really, really impressed with June. Korea will probably end up sending Si Hyung Lee to collect that second men's spot, who actually placed ahead of Jun Hwan in the ranking competition and won it uh, in the if, just a couple of weeks ago. So we'll we'll see how that goes and if Korea manages to secure two spots for the Olympics next year. And hey, Donovan managed to qualify a spot for Mexico, which is amazing. Even when he made the free, I was just like, this is everything I've ever wanted. Thank you, world. <laughs> We've watched Donovan for so many years and just whenever he's out on the ice, you know, his smile is so cheery and just makes you feel happy and his skating is so lovely even if his technical content isn't up to par with some of the other skaters around him. He's just such a gem. And I really want him to have that Olympic experience because imagine, like, imagine how much it would mean to him as as someone who's a skater from Mexico. Like that that kind of experience is truly once in a lifetime, and I'm just so proud and happy for him. Agreed. This is kind of why I'm happy with the new rules under our interpretation of the rules. <laughs> under our interpretation, uh, <laughs> because it, it means that more small feds got allocated spots at Worlds. So. Yay, we love that. Small fed supremacy. <laughs> so that's it for part one of our world's coverage. We'll be back in just a few days with our episode all about the ice dance and ladies events. Thank you to our transcribing and quality control team, Evie as always for editing, and Gab for graphic design. If you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via our website, in the low podcast.com or on our Twitter. You can find our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you enjoy the show and want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us on our coffee page. And we'd like to give a huge thank you to all the listeners who have contributed to our team thus far. You can find links to all of our social media pages and our coffee on our website. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Kite, Yogita, and Evie. Bye! See ya! Bye!